This video will cover the factory design pattern. I'll explain what it is, why you'd want to use it, and give some examples of it using C Sharp. Normally when you want to instantiate an object, you use code like this. Data type variable name equals new class. Your object is created with the new class. With the factory design pattern, instead of instantiating objects this way, you call a function that instantiates the object and returns it to you. So why would you want to use this? In a large program, you may instantiate your objects dozens or hundreds of places. If you ever need to change the way you do that, then you need to go back and make your change in dozens or hundreds of places in your code. With a factory design pattern, all those places call the factory, and if you need to make a change to how you instantiate your object, you might be able to do that by just changing the factory method and everything else still works the same. It's almost always better if you can make a change in one place instead of hundreds of places because it's easy to miss a few places when you make the change. For the first example, I'll show you how to create a player object. Here's our player class for a role-playing game. It takes in hit points, experience points, and gold and sets the property values. Normally, you'd instantiate that by saying player my player equals new player so give him 10 hit points, 0 experience points, and 50 gold. The simplest way to implement a factory is to go to the player class and add a static method that creates the player object. We'll take the same parameters and return a new player just passing in those parameters. Now we're going to go to the player constructor and instead of having it public, we're going to make it private. So it can only be called by other methods inside the player class. This way it forces anyone that wants to create a new player object to go through our static create new player method. So if we go back to our code, this old way won't work. Instead we need to call the create new player method. Now if we ever change the way we need to create the player, we could just do it in this create new player static function. This is nice but it's not really useful putting the static factory method here. About the only time I use this is in the singleton design pattern which is a special situation where you only want to have one instance of the object anywhere in your application. And I'll explain that in another video. A more common way to implement the factory design pattern is to have a separate class. In this case, we'll create a player factory class. This is a static class and it has a static method that we're going to call load player and it returns a new player. Now if you notice here we have an error because our player constructor is private. For this situation you need to either make this public or make it internal. If it's internal the constructor can be used by anything else inside the assembly. So our player factory is in the same assembly as the player class so that's good. Now our player factory can create a new player. Let's go back and remove the static method from the player class and now in our calling code we're going to call the player factory since the player factory is static and the load player function are static we don't need to instantiate a player factory object we can just call it and load player works for us again this is nice but not super useful yet where it really comes in handy is if we need to change the way that we're going to load the player. 
For example, let's say we're writing a program that could be run on a phone or could be run on a website or could be run on a desktop computer. They may store the data differently. They may store it in an XML file. They may store it in a database. So our load player, we want to have that have options. So I created this load player 2 function, which goes out and looks to see if an XML file exists. If so, it reads in the values. We'll pretend it's reading some values here, even though we're just setting values to the variables. And then it calls the player constructor. If the XML file doesn't exist, it will create a new player. So let's say one day our boss comes in and says, well, now we need to have this also work for the database. We can easily change the load player to function to check to see if the database exists and if it can pull in the data from there. Then if not, maybe it checks for an XML file. And if the XML file doesn't exist, then it just goes and creates a new player. But to every other part of our program that was calling the player factory, it doesn't have to change. We just need to change the method here in one place. That's what makes the factory method very useful. We have one point that everything goes through, so if we ever need to change something, we change that one function and everything else still works the same with no changes. Another nice thing about the factory method is it can return objects that are different data types, as long as the objects all implement the same interface or have the same base class. So let's say we have a monster class in our game. Here's our monster class. But as we expand it, we end up creating a flying monster class that inherits from monster, a land monster class that also inherits from monster, and a sea monster class that inherits from monster. Now we can create a monster factory, again a public static class with a public static method, and here it gets a pretend random number and returns either a new flying monster, new land monster, or new sea monster. So if we ever wanted to create a space monster, we would just need to create the new space monster class, have it inherit from monster, and then change our factory method here. We wouldn't need to go through our whole program and change every place that creates a monster to now have it create the new space monster. I found the factory method to be really useful in real life applications. In one application I worked on, we were translating work requests between multiple systems into multiple output systems. And every time we did that, we created a translator object that would read the one format, translate it to the next format so we could send it to the next system. Unfortunately, there was a problem in the library we were using to do the translator, and it didn't release some memory. So after it created a couple thousand of these objects, the system ran out of memory and crashed. Since all the translator objects were being created by a factory, it was easy to go into the factory method and tell it to reuse the existing translator object instead of creating a new one each time, and that solved our memory problem. So that's one real-world example where having a factory can help you. It does take a little bit of extra effort to create the factory, but it's fairly simple, and it gives you a lot of flexibility. That's why I like using it. Like most design patterns, you probably don't want to use this one everywhere. That's a common problem for people who first learn design patterns. However, it's good to know about this design pattern and how to use it. I'll be doing some more videos on different design patterns and how to implement them in C Sharp. So if you have any questions about this one or any other design pattern, please leave a comment below and I'll be sure to answer your question. Thanks.